everyone. I was happy when Jesse Bernard and I were able to record this episode because her bubbly energy was infectious from the moment that I met her. Jessie is a Haitian American who grew up and lived in several cities in the U.S., as well as spent time in Haiti. Today, she's a marketing professional and content creator who lives in Accra, Ghana. And like some of my most recent guests, she decided and executed her move in the middle of the pandemic. In this episode, you'll hear her reflections about growing up Haitian American and floating between the two worlds. We discuss the longstanding and challenging stereotypes about Haiti, and this leads to a greater conversation about the media depictions of Black countries. She talks about living in a country where you don't have to think about being Black, and she also gives some insight as to how she's been able to maintain her career and work remotely. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and don't forget to subscribe. Welcome to the Global Chatter. All right. Welcome to the latest episode of the Global Chatter podcast. I am Amanda Bates, which I think most of you know me by now because you've been following us, I guess, at this point uh, since 2020 with the podcast. And as you've heard from the introduction, my guest today is Jesse Bernard, who I am thrilled to have on this show because I think we're going to talk about some of my favorite topics, which are probably up her alley um, when it comes to travel and particularly with where she's based right now in her story. And so welcome to the podcast, Jesse. Thank you for having me. What you're doing is super important. I love it. You know what? I'm only able to do it because I have folks like you who are willing to be part of the story. So <laughs> I take all the compliments. So, Jesse, here's the deal. Every time I start this podcast, I have to give folks context, right? And they always hear me say this. So where in the world are you currently today? Today, I am in Accra, Ghana, West Africa. Oh, OK. You know what? And I was telling you off air, I been a lot of places. I have not been to Ghana yet. And so <laughs> I am excited to hear about your experiences there. And how long have you been in Ghana? Uh, a little over a year now. Oh my gosh. So did you move during the pandemic? Were you one of the crazy people? I was one of the people who moved during the panoramic. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You know what? Let, we're going to pause that story because we're going to get there because I, I have yet to hear a sane story about why somebody moved in the middle of COVID. So I feel like yours is probably just as exciting and has probably just as many you know, twist and turns as everybody else's. Yeah. And it actually came after a, a very extreme heartbreak. So we'll, we'll get into that. Oh no. Oh no. Those might be our favorite stories. Okay. Let's, <laughs> but let's back it up for a bit. <laughs> back it. No. Did you say relationship? Cause we, we like to talk about relationships, but let's back this up for a bit. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a few places. I would say the place that I grew up most is in Miami. I grew up in the Haitian community. So little Haiti, North Miami, those areas, um, very Haitian population. Um, in addition to that, I moved to places like Boston. I moved to the Haitian community in Boston, the Haitian community in New York. <laughs> and I've also been in Haiti for an extended <laughs> period of time. Yes. <laughs> So I'm I'm gathering with that running theme that you come from an immigrant family. This is true. Yes. So tell me a little bit about them. Who immigrated and when did they come to what I'm assuming is the U.S.? The U.S., yes. Funny enough, my family immigrated from Haiti. And uh, my mom, usually people usually um, attach that to like a refugee thing. My mom was actually a yeah. saleswoman. Like she used to go to different Caribbean islands like Puerto Rico, Curacao buy goods and then resell them in Haiti. So this was mm. when the economy wasn't so bad. And actually they gave her uh, like a temporary one. And she was like, I don't really want to stay there. I think people suffer a lot there. I see they just like barely have time to take care of their kids. They just wake up and they're out the door. <laughs> and she's like here, like in Haiti, like I have somebody to take care of the kids. I have somebody. But, you know, as the economic situation deteriorated more, that's when she realized that, you know, she would have to take our family and we'd have to live in Miami. Right off the bat, and when it's, I appreciate what you just said, is that often, and, and I get that there was an economic reason, mm -hmm. but often, and I've said this before, when we talk about Black people moving in particular, it's almost always because they're fleeing something, right? Yes. 
And and I appreciate you saying, look, my my mom had a career, right? She made an economic decision, yeah. <laughs> right? But she had a career. And we don't always necessarily attach that to when Black folks move. Does, it, yeah. does that make sense to Do you see where I'm kind of going? Yeah, I really appreciate that, actually, the more I think about it. Yeah, it was a choice, a tough choice, but a choice. Right, right. And 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 where did she decide to take your family first? Was it Miami? Yeah, Miami is like, if anybody's been to Miami, that's like the first stop for a Haitian. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and shockingly enough, I have not been, it's really weird where I've been or where I've not been. I have not been to Miami. And I think, let me tell you why. I think that whenever I'm flying out of a major airport in the South, it's always Atlanta. <laughs> and so I I have not spent that much time in Miami. And so how old were you when you moved to Miami? Okay, so this is the thing. I have five siblings and the first three were born in Haiti. And when my mom was pregnant with me and my sister, both of our situations, she was <laughs> like, oh my God, I don't know if I should stay here or go. I don't really want to go. Da, da, da. So my mom actually gave birth to me and my sister, the two at the end. Um, in Miami, and then mm -hmm. after that, she would take us uh, to and fro until we permanently stayed. Got you. And so, tell me about that. Like you, at a very young age, obviously you were born into a Haitian family, right? Yes. At a very young age, what was it like growing up in? I, I'm almost going to say a Haitian expat community, right? Because it even is. all those places you mentioned, you moved into. I mean, immigrant to. We will not get into the politics of that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? You were you were with folks who both had one foot in the U.S., both back in Haiti. And so what was that like, especially I, I have a second part to that, because I really want to think about what was it like when you were in Haitian communities in the U.S.? And then what was it like when you went to visit or stay in Haiti? OK, so let me let, let's also bring some light to that. The three biggest cities where Haitians live are Miami, New York and Boston. And I've lived in all three. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'm going to say I think this can be also something that other, you know, ha whether it's Haitian, Caribbean American or Afri African from Africa and American hyphenated <laughs> like that, or right. like Cameroonian American or Jamaican American can realize is that people like me are what are called go-betweens. Um, I saw that in the, um, the museum of the Ellis Island in New York. We're go-betweens. We're go-between mm. between both cultures. Um, like in the, the, in the aspect of a Haitian, my mother didn't speak English. She still doesn't speak English well. So I'm her translator at eight years old. I'm her translator. Um, mm -hmm. When I leave the house and I go to school in America, I'm, I'm expected to behave as an American. But when I return home, mm -hmm. I'm expected to behave as a Haitian. And I go between those mm -hmm. two cultures and I know how to move accordingly. And in America, mm -hmm. people address me as a Haitian. Let's say I, I tell somebody, oh, I'm American. And they'll be like, no, well, really, what are you? Or like they find out that my family is Haitian and I speak Creole and all this other stuff. They're like, well, why were you ashamed to say you're Haitian? I can't really say, fully claim American. <laughs> when I go to Haiti, because my Creole now has a very American accent, they're like, well, you're American. So it becomes this. And I, and, and I feel like a lot of the Caribbeans or um, people from Africa, they can also, um, you know, recognize with this too. Like I never really have like a set place. So when I do say I'm Haitian American, I really mm -hmm. do feel Haitian American because I'm like halfway in between both. And I'm kind of forced to be halfway in between both. Yeah, I totally got you. Like, so there's a term and it, it's funny. So there are two terms that I think one of them definitely applies to you. And there's a second term that I'm like, it might kind of apply. So there's a term called third culture kid. And that's yep. basically yep. <laughs> kids, you know, who cross borders, right? Of course, right? Yeah. And then... What's really great about the book that Dave Pollock and Ruth Van Raken wrote is that when they updated it, they include cross-cultural kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are the kids who, and I same similar story with me when I was in the U.S. before I moved was Cameroonian home, right? right. But, but American okay. outside. And what was wild about it is that in my case, my parents were not of the same tribe. So they didn't speak the same tribal languages to them, to each other. So they spoke English to each other. They spoke their tribal languages to their family people, right? right. So in the home, 
English was the language. But then, of course, you and and you know very much when you're in your home, the food, the culture, you know, whatever the religious identity, all of that, right, plays into it. And then you step outside, yeah. and it's oh, we're in America, right? Yes, <laughs> and and it's and it's super funny because I totally relate to is that when you go back to the co- the country of origin, people are always like, yeah, but your accent though, yeah. and the way you do things. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's like you're Haitian. I get it. It's like you're Cameroonian, but are you really? Because, yeah, you know, you like, do things differently. Right. And yeah. I think yeah. in function between both, but neither really fully accept me, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think then that's why, and I don't know if you found this as you were growing up. I think that's why it's easy to find community with other people children and teenagers who kind of in that same space yes you know absolutely. and whether and whether or not they were haitian right they could for all you care they could have been once again cameroonian they could have been vietnamese they could have been whatever but do you know what i mean just those group of kids where it's like yeah all of us have a parent or two that are not from here oh yeah definitely actually like as far as dating and all that other stuff whether it was a jamaican or a cameroonian like my ex or whatever it's much more easier for me to date one of them because they'll understand my cultural nu- nuances much easier versus somebody who's not um from abroad or like their family is not foreign yeah no i get it it seems like okay obviously you lived in all those different places how often did your family travel internationally so i'm gonna say did your family go back to haiti repeatedly or and in that did you also go to other caribbean islands or did you even go to other parts of the world no it was always haiti and back that was it (laughs) (laughs) i mean that's like many immigrant stories i didn't know you could have been like let's hop over to puerto rico okay (laughs) and so how long would you say in haiti are are these short trips or did you ever have a period where you just went back and lived? Yeah, like I just had extended like, you know, like very long periods because I had one one of the issues that I had was like leaving like my grandfather and all that. Other, it, mostly it was like too much for me. And then they were like, oh, I think we should just like leave her. <laughs> so so oh. <laughs> that type of thing. And like for me, um, I always felt more at ease in Haiti. Haiti actually changed my life mm. in a very good way. Tell me more. So tell me more for the first time going back to Haiti. And this was a long period that I hadn't gone. And I didn't even have any memory of Haiti. Um, at that point, I remember the kids, they were so mean. They were saying stuff like, you know, like kind of like how Africans get teased for like cuts and stuff like that. We also get the same thing. Haitians get the same thing. Yeah. Um, we're like the anom- yeah. anam- the strange one anomaly. Um, I the word was escaping me um, yeah. of the Caribbean. Um, and our development is more and more so like, you know, that you would see in Africa and our culture is different also as well, because we didn't have Western interference for almost for pretty much our whole existence almost. <sighs> yeah. So when I would hear what the kids would say, and then when I went back to Haiti and I realized that Contrary to what you always see on TV, it's not all like that. That's the the danger of a single narrative. Like, I want to point it out and make it very clear to anybody who's hearing this. Listen well, come close. I'm not telling you what you see on TV is not true. But what I'm telling you is that it's not the complete story. Yeah. When I went, I was like, oh, my God. So, like, okay, there's not, like, because they would tell us the huts thing, too. And I'm like, you know, and you would see, like, mansions. (laughs) All kinds of things. Like, you know what I mean? So like, I was like, okay, and I'm, and I could live and I saw the beautiful beaches and cause like the way that they, they train your mind to see a place like Haiti, it's like the beach shoreline stops at DR and then God is like, no, there shall not be no beach that will cross this border. And it's <laughs> right. it really isn't like that. And it's so crazy. And like, you know, and like, I just, and you know, even if you would tell people like they wouldn't believe you or anything like that, just because of the images they see, which I guess, you know, I understand or whatever. Um, but you know, in, in, in the way that Haiti always opened my eyes and always made me feel welcome and I didn't have to deal with the whole minority stuff and all that other stuff, like I felt a level of comfort. And one of the things that Haiti also taught me when I, when I realized that, okay, these things were all a lie, I started to do research and read and try to understand what happened. And as I started going through it and going through it, and this is how it connects to Africa, 
I realized, um, you know, like they were talking about uh, a lot of the freedom fighters who won our independence. And there were, a lot of them were people who were fresh from Africa. Like they knew they were born in places like Benin or Senegal. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, let me go check out these countries where we originate from too. And as I started to read their histories too, and I started to know about the the great kingdoms that were here in Africa and stuff like that, I realized what they said about Africa was a lie. What they said about Haiti was a lie. The whole every, everything that I knew about my existence was a lie. And after that, I realized that I wasn't yeah. afraid to travel within Africa anymore. Mm. What you said is incredibly powerful because as someone who's grown up in West Africa and there are narratives and they are hardcore push narratives. Right. And I imagine it's the same thing with Haiti, right? Because here's the thing. Every time we see stories of these places, it is always a moment of despair. Yes. And it's never stories about something that has happened. Right. Because I, let's be honest, if I look at American media right now, Haiti right now isn't in the news unless there is a natural disaster. Yes. A political upheaval or unrest, right? Right, right. Or a health crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't ever think of a time when anything I've seen related to Haiti, and I'm a I'm a voracious reader of I hope you use that the right word. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Of 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 news and and I follow what's going on on the planet as best as I can. And there's never any like this amazing thing that happened. And so one, we all, you're right. There's always that single story that I I know where that um, TED talk came from, but also the fact that when you think about particularly as black and brown people in certain places, we also absorb that because that's the story that we're told. Yes. And then when we come across those folks in our spaces it's odd that there can be so much disparaging comments made because there's such a belief that, well, you all, y'all aren't developed. (laughs) Y'all, you know, y'all don't have X, Y, and Z. And so, oh, it totally resonates as a kid who grew up in Africa. (laughs) I'm sitting here like, yup, that sounds about right. Yeah, but you know, at least now Africa's getting a little, you know, a little something, something. Haiti is so- Yeah, no, that's true. It, It is- yeah, you're right. Like, at the end of the Africa day, is getting a little something. It's, it's getting a little something, right? But like at the end of the day, like Haiti is like the only one in the Caribbean. Now that should ring a bell to yourselves that like obviously something is systematically wrong if it's the only place in the Caribbean. But also too, like that 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 thing of we having to learn to stand on our own, unfortunately, I think that's also a great source of my strength. So being Haitian, going to Haiti. It has made me who I am in my entirety, and I'm very grateful for it. And you know what? You also said something else that has always stuck out to me, and I don't think if you haven't had this experience, it doesn't quite click, but I've heard this from other folks from the Caribbean who particularly had a Caribbean identity and American identity. And you, you said it in passing, but I was, I'm going to pull that thread. Okay. And that was when you went to Haiti, you didn't have to worry about being a minority. Yeah, just like here in West Africa. And yeah. Right. <laughs> and I'm just saying, if you've never had that experience, <laughs> it can be kind of, a, it's kind of amazing when you do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is not at the fort. Race is not. At the, you know, so crazy in America, I hear about, oh, you guys, it's all about race. I don't even want it to be about race, but kind of race is kind of like shoved in your throat in a way. Right. <laughs> but like here, like it's not, nobody even thinks about it. Now, with with me and my aspect of being real, I want to say that not all racial issues are expunged here. Like it, just like in Haiti or the Caribbean or any right. place in Africa, things like colorism and all those things exist. However, yeah, for sure. however, you don't even think that you're black most of the time. No, you know why? Because I said this to someone the other day and they looked at me like I was crazy, but then they realized and said, oh, what you're saying makes sense. And this is what I said. When you're in a predominantly black country, all the media for the most part is black, (laughs) right? A lot of the ads are black. A lot of the billboards have black people. The The president and the leadership (laughs) is black. And the person looked at me, they were a black person and they were like, Wait, I was like, 
Yeah. So you don't think about being black. I mean, you have to put that in the context, especially when we talk about I hate these like diaspora diasporic wars that happen right on social media. I hate it. You know, (laughs) I hate them where people start pitting against each other. And I said, but here's the thing you have to understand when people are growing up and living and immersed in a predominantly black country they don't actually think about their race because they don't actually practically need to. No, they don't. (laughs) And here's, and I said, here's the thing that applies to any racial group though. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, it's not unique to black people, right? If you are in Southeast Asia and everyone around you, for example, is for the most part Chinese, right? Now I know there are a ton of ethnic groups, right? But they, they are Chinese, right? You are not thinking about being Chinese because yes. everyone's Chinese, right? But it, it just blew this person's mind. And I was like, we don't think about race, which is why the conversations you have about race can look very different for immigrants. Oh, yes. Because they haven't had to think about it in the same way. Yep. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I actually decided to move um, into Ghana. Like I actually wanted to move to Haiti, but because holistically the country obviously is not in a position for me to live in it yet. Like I can live, visit the Northern part, which is relatively safe, but I want something that is like, holistically yeah. safe right now. And, um, you know, I was like, I was telling my therapist cause I was in therapy for a year. That's a whole nother story. And it has to do with traveling, race, Africa. That's a whole nother story. And um, one of the things I was telling my therapist was that I was tired of microaggressions. I was tired of that stuff. You know, I actually, yeah. I actually came to vacation yeah. here in Ghana while I was working before, not vacation, but I just came to check, make sure everything checked out like how I wanted it. And it, it would be like how I thought, at least for the most part. And I was telling my coworkers like, oh, um, I'm in Ghana. I was taking a remote call from them. And then they were like, is the internet going to work? Like, I don't know if they really have internet like that over there. And I was like, oh, they only said that to me because I'm in, in West Africa. Because if I was in Paris, I guarantee you they wouldn't say that. Now, and by the way, we got parts of America that definitely don't have broadband. Yeah. <laughs> like, that for, don't even get me started. Like, I just saw a whole study about where fast and available internet is like in this country and trust and believe it's not everywhere. Anyway, no. this is your story. I'm, Carry on. <laughs> listen, I'm not going to pretend and act like there's, this, there's not issues. Sometimes there is, but for the most part, I can actually get it to be 5G. And, um, you know, I just, some of the stuff that they say and some of the stuff, even like with stuff like where they want to touch your hair and like nobody cares about that because everybody here have the same hair. You understand what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> These people are black. Yeah, like, <laughs> nobody's fascinated. Or, they don't care. Or anything like that. Like, so those are some like, of the daily things where I'm like, oh, that's a blessing. I don't have to deal with that nonsense. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. And, and real talk. Sometimes I'm the one with the janky internet and I'm in the U.S. Because I've had talked to my cousins in Cameroon and they're like, why is your internet freezing? And I'm like, you are in. <laughs> why do you have better internet than I do? And they're like, because we have better internet. And I said, you know what? Let me not be out here with some assumptions because you're not in the States. And so, you know what? And you've already kind of touched on this. So I, at what point as an adult or at what point did you start doing international travel? I mean, we talked about you going back and forth to Haiti, but at what point did you start to go to other places in the world? Okay. (laughs) So yes, we've touched on that. (laughs) Haiti has been one of the reasons that my mind has been open and I haven't been afraid. So after that, I started actually more so in 2014. In 2014, I moved to South Africa. Okay, what were you doing before you up to move to South Africa? <laughs> like, what were you okay, doing? Okay, so I actually, <laughs> I was in college. I studied, and I guess that's an important aspect of me. I studied international relations. Gotcha, makes sense. But I studied <laughs> international relations because, like I said, again, Haiti. I actually wanted to understand NGOs and work for an NGO. Like, my mindset has totally changed, but I thought that they were the good guys initially, yeah. for the most part. And, um, so I went to South Africa. I, I actually, I've been an expert now. This is my third time. So I went to South Africa twice. Mm -hmm. So South Africa, the first time I went to Johannesburg where I started working for an NGO. My, the owner of the NGO was actually like a very high level official in the UN. 
And Mm -hmm. um, from there, I realized, I started to realize that NGOs aren't what they really are. But anyways, it's a long, uh, another long story. I'll go back to part two of South Africa, where I started to work in the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. I went back to uh, South Africa and moved to a village that was close, not too far from Zimbabwe in the northern area. So it was like Mm -hmm. really, really rural. Very different from what people usually um, picture South Africa to be. You know, because South Africa has some really big disparities. Um, so I went yeah. to the I went to the village. That was one of my heartbreaking stories. So I actually had a, a heartbreaking story as far as relationship before coming here, and I had a, a career general life crisis uh, before coming here as well. And I read a lot. I studied apartheid. I studied this that. Like I said, I'm classically trained in international relations, so I know a lot about cross cultural management. And when I went into the Peace Corps, I first went to a house, the training house where we stayed for like a first couple of months or a few weeks. And I had a really good relationship with my host mother. Everything was great. I was doing well and all the other stuff. Then I had got transferred to my permanent site um, with another family. And um, it was a mom with like five daughters. And they were like apparently like the chiefs of the village. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I moved. It might actually be hard for me to talk about this. I moved into my permanent site with them and I thought it was going to be great because the mom, she looked younger, younger than the, my first site mother. And, um, you know, you know, I thought it just was going to be great. Long story short, um, I ended up being the most depressed, the most heartbroken in my life there. The mother there, it's like, she didn't like me and I couldn't understand why I couldn't understand why. And there was, a I had a fellow volunteer who was like maybe 10 minutes away from me. Um, in the next village and she was white and um, you know we both were being teachers in the school and uh, one apparently her principal at a training he that we me all four of us were at um, he pulled her aside and told her that he was glad that she he got a white volunteer and didn't get a black one mm. so mm. I, I started to realize a lot what color was the principal black but that's what I'm telling you, Amanda, like okay. our even, but then again, I want to say, I want to point out South Africa in particular is a special mindset as well, because they still have suffered from a program. Yeah. Yeah. But colorism and all those things still exist in general. And they trained us. They told us that that could happen. And, you know, like a lot of the volunteers, I would see them in our group chats. They were, their families were taking them places. They were showing them off, going to weddings and all this other stuff. And I really wanted to go to a wedding. And I told my whole family that. And actually, one day I got up and I saw them all dressed and they were going to a wedding. And I was like, oh, why didn't you guys tell me this? And it was like, they said something like, oh, oh, we didn't know you want to go. Well, I was like, I told you. And then they was like, oh, well, we don't got room in the car. And then they left with one seat empty. Mm. So like, wow. it was just a, like a lot of different things. I, I don't even want to go too deep into that. I spent like a year into therapy trying to understand um, what had happened there and a lot of stuff like that. But I ended up um, leaving the Peace Corps uh, like right before COVID started. So in February uh, 2020 mm-hmm. or something like that. But that was like one of my most heartbreaking experience. And when I got back home, everybody was like, don't go abroad again. And then a lot of people were saying, oh, it's because it was Africa in general. And I was like, no, I think it was a special case in that in, in that aspect, the, the where I was and things like that. And I was like, but still, regardless of what had happened to me there, because I, I told them, I'm like, you can open the news today and you'll see that South Africa is still having racial issues. I mean, what happened to them was like, what, 30 years ago, apartheid ended. So that's natural. What happened to yeah. them is natural. Um, and I'll say that for any Black American or any Black person who's not in Africa, if you are moving because of racial issues, you may want to holistically think moving to South Africa because they are still having racial issues within themselves at this moment. All right. So if you're joining us after the break, you definitely heard Jesse talk about kind of the challenging experience she had in South Africa and 
even with that, though, it has not deterred her on living on the on the African continent. And so, Jesse, my question for you was, what then made you decide to come back to the continent of Africa? In particular, how did you end up choosing to live in Ghana? Fun fact, I actually wanted to go to Ghana first. So one, a few of the factors that ended, ended up making me not go to Ghana first was like, okay, I couldn't find uh, the Peace Corp contract that I was trying to go through with Ghana would have me waiting like a year. And I was like, oh, I don't want to wait a year. I want to go now, 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 now. So that's why I ended up going to South Africa. But funny enough, remember how I said I studied international relations? So I had an international business class and a cross-cultural uh, management class. And they both required me to do uh, like cross analysis between the U.S. or another country and another country. And most of the people in my class, which I was probably like three or four, there's three or four black girls in there. Um, and we all actually made a group. And um, everybody picked some European country or like Japan or something like that. And I was like, no, I want to do Africa. I want to do Africa. So good for you. Uh, good <laughs> yeah, for you. And this was like well before like the year of return. Cause like now Ghana is starting to get popular, but this was like before people could even point, even knew where it was. So this was probably like 2013. And I was like, okay, I got to go find a country. And I started, I was like, give me stats. I need stats. I need numbers. And I was like, okay, let's look at crime rate. Let's look at health. Let's look at, you know, all those type of statistics that you actually need to live, live somewhere, not TikToks only, but like actual numbers. And I was like, okay, when I looked and I was like, I need an English speaking country. Cause even though I am familiar with Francophone being Haitian, I'm more so in the Anglophone re area because I've studied more so in, in America. And, um, when I looked at, you know, when I, I think I typed in safest countries in Africa, Ghana was one of the options. So then when I went to it, I just kept going down the stats going, I was like, okay. And then business looks like it's stable there. They don't really have coup d'etats. Okay. All right. This is where I need to go. And, um, I, I presented it and people were like really blown away. Like they were like, this is, this is like some place in Africa. I was like, yes, this is some place in Africa. It's safer than some of the places in, <laughs> in America and some places in Europe. Yeah, it's very, it's quite safe. You know what I'm saying? And, and, um, you know, after I did a, a couple of presentations on Ghana, I was like, well, you know, maybe I should go and do business in Ghana, but let me be honest mm. with you. At the time, it wasn't no TikTok and it was, it was still very little information yeah. around 2013. Yeah. So, um, you know, at that point, you know, I, one, one, it, the Peace Corps thing was one thing, but the reason why I decided to do the Peace Corps, because if I felt it was more safe, because I would have housing and stuff like that, I, I wasn't yeah. bold enough in myself, even though I studied cross cultural business and international and all that other stuff, I wasn't confident in myself to go and make my own business. And it's funny enough, after all that I went through, and I even went through the Peace Corps and, and shed tears and went through one of the most mentally horrific um, times in my life, that I'm actually going back to it now. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah. <laughs> so walk me through. So you did your Peace Corps experience, but it got, COVID was also in part of it, right? <laughs> and then did you, was it Peace Corps that took you back? That took you to Ghana or was it that you said, look, I'm just going to go myself because I'm going to build a business there? I'm going to I went by myself. Like, OK, so remember, I did two legs in 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 this. This is my third attempt. I did two separate attempts <laughs> in South Africa. I got to talk. Ooh. And people said I was mad. People said I was crazy. People were like, if you go back there again, that's your business. And I was like, but, you know, it's a different country. And this is where I actually right. to go to originally. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to go because I'm not happy here and I don't want to stay here. This is it, it's do or die. And I'm going to die trying. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? And I don't and, you know, Europe is cool. Europe is cool. It's just cool. But a lot yeah. of the times I hear black expats and they suffer those same microaggressions in those places, too. So I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want that. I want a place where I can come and I feel welcome. And I don't you know what I'm saying? And I don't get me wrong. There is there is and I'm going to start to talk more about it in my TikTok. There's a delicate balance between the diaspora and Africa, although I feel like Ghana is probably the best place. And that's one of the reasons that I fell in love with it again through the research when I was reading Kwame Nkrumah. So, you know, yeah. um, 
you know, like I told you, I was in me learning originally Haitian history and learning about Toussaint, which was our, you know, the person who brought us yeah. to the freedom and finding out about characters like Kwame and Kroma and Toure and all those people. Like I read, a, I read a lot about them and I loved his vision as a Pan-Africanist and, you know, as a Haitian, like, you know, um, where yeah. we had so many different people from different tribes and different countries come together in Haiti and still overtake one of the world's most powerful um, colonial powers and keep them out of Haiti. I am a very serious Pan-Africanist. And when I saw his vision, I was like, huh, you're talking to the right person. <laughs> you know? And so, no, and, and yeah, no, I got you. And, <laughs> and I find that with a lot of people of color, and actually, let me back this up with a lot of black folks, right? There is a lot of, there is a heritage and a history seeking, right? That, as part of their moving experience often, right? Yeah. There is a very, and it's not everyone, but for a number of people I've had a privilege to talk to, that has been their backstory. And I remember telling folks, you know, back when I worked in ed, when you look at study abroad, interestingly enough, when you look at study abroad, particularly with Black students, they most often wanted to go to the areas where it was predominantly Black because there is a history there is a story, right, that they are connected to, which oftentimes their schools didn't even offer study abroad to those places. Because, But for them, they really wanted to go to the Africas, right? They wanted to go to part of the Caribbean. They wanted to go to these communities and, and get more of that. So your story just gels completely with that. And so my question for you then is, you know, and it's funny because Ghana was the original place and it's almost like that's where you kind of should. <laughs> you, in one hand, it's like that's where you should have gone. It would have been great if that was the first place you could have gone to. Right. But at the uh, but on the other hand, I think it, it does show that you were committed to it because even in having challenging experiences in a different part of the continent didn't deter you from the continent, which I think shows clearly the level of commitment you had to that. And so my question for you now is, okay, you've decided and you, you know, you've moved to Ghana, how, and you moved on your own. So there's no sending agency. It's not Peace Corps. It's not for school or whatever. How did you decide or determine that you were going to be able to financially support yourself? Okay. And I want to make this, (laughs) I want to say this so that people can hear this, that I was actually going to talk more about it on my TikToks as well. Um, so what I did was I, and I used some of my savings. That was one. Cause one thing also too, um, like especially Ghana, and I see this as a, a common trend in, um, Africa is that cash yeah. is king. Of course. Um, and so I used some of my savings, but guess what? I kept working remotely. Mm, okay. Say more. But guess what, Amanda? And that's why I'm saying like today is a big transition for me. Today is my last day of working remotely. <laughs> okay, because we have great timing. What was yeah. your uh, what was your career? What were you doing, or what have you been doing remotely? Okay, so Amanda, this is going to go into <laughs> exactly what I'm doing now in Ghana. So I've worked in okay. tra- travel for like several years, but I've actually mm-hmm. been doing marketing remotely. Um, so um, for a college back in Miami, uh, they actually don't even really know I'm here. Uh, but I did not care. <laughs> by the well, by the by the time this airs, you would have completely separated, so it doesn't oh, matter. Really? <laughs> so, oh my gosh! Okay, so you've been working. Wait, and, I mean, you're not the first one I've heard this. So you've been working remotely for for a for a entity in, and so you haven't had to be in the office, correct? Oh yeah, no. I already had my excuses ready, and if they had to tell me to come in, I already knew. I had to make. I had made my plan. I was like, if if they if anything, I'll give them their two weeks and use some sick days, and then I'll be gone. But I was like, <laughs> I, I, not, I was like, there's nothing that can keep me here again. Like I literally just, I literally just had my like a year between me and South Africa. I spent a year in therapy. I healed, and then I was like. Mm, gotta gear up gotta go again wow okay 
So, I mean, so realistically, you you had a job that you were working remotely. That's fine. That's not weird. Whatever. People do that. Yes. And then, but you're at this turning point. And tell us about this turning point. What did you decide to do? So I decided to um, go into, like I say, travel, which um, is my expertise. I've been doing that. I've been working in the airlines. I worked initially in Air Canada and then American Airlines. And I've been doing that for several years. And in particular, I was mm. working in the first class or the VV and the VVIP area, which is called Concierge Key. Um, I did mm -hmm. that for several years. I was good at it. However, I just felt like it wasn't my place. And I feel like God showed me, I knew that before, but God definitely gave me some examples while I was there. Um, mm -hmm. And I just really wanted to create something for us, by us, um, and just kind of like change a little bit of narratives. Like, you know, like when people want to go to Lux places, they want to go to Paris and, and stuff like that. But yeah. I feel like you can start to say, let's go to Senegal. I feel like you can start to say, let's go to Namibia. Yeah. I feel like you can start yeah. to say, let's go to Ghana. I feel like they, that, that these things exist. And I feel like better than aid, this is what's going to help um, mm. a lot of these uh, countries to come up. Um, and a lot of unity between us. Like I say, I'm a Pan-Africanist. You know what I'm saying? Um, just by yeah. going to these places and exploring. I don't want you to feel like because you want to do big things and, and you know, fancy things that you have to go engage somebody at the Eiffel Tower. You don't have to do that there. You can do that in these places. And I want to um, start to curate things and show people that they can do that. Africa, because a lot of times I feel like anywhere in Africa, they always have to show it like, oh, you're doing some like, off the grid, roughing it type stuff. You got to wrap your right. hair. And it don't got to be, if you want that, that's cool, you know? But um, if you want to do something that's, you know, upscale and classy, you can do that here too. I love it. And, and so I'm hearing from you that your brand is really focusing on probably African travel. Although I imagine depending on how, you decide to position and pivot, maybe you might even include the Caribbean <laughs> um, in the future, maybe, if yes. it doesn't I'm already. Waiting. I'm waiting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no. And I, and this is why I love when people come into this space because they are trying to show something different. And, and the fact that you live in Ghana too, right? Like you're like, this is my daily reality. And so I want to show you you know, what many of these countries have to offer. And so is your brand now looking at, you know, full traveling services, group tours, like what kind of offerings are you thinking or what, or what have you been doing? So because I worked in Concierge Key, which was like a tailor-made type of thing, like we had clients like Trump or Dwayne Wade and Jennifer Lopez and those things like that. Um, I was exposed to how to get people from, that the minute they touch the airport or right before they touch the airport to their destination back without a hitch and with class and quality. And, um, I, I don't think maybe, maybe tours, but not really, I, I want something that's very personal. And I also want something that is, you know, like I said, for in, in the more so for black people, I'm not going to say that, Oh, nobody, I'm, I'm going to block anybody for it, but I want to create that safe space because I know, how many times I've been in an uh, unsafe space um, in regards to that. Um, one thing is yeah. that although I feel like looks could sometimes be a little bit toxic because people be faking it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. If you want to spend your money and enjoy your money in that aspect, I feel like it should be a company, which would be mine that could, you know, you know, accommodate you that you won't you you won't feel like oh are these people going to feel some kind of way are they going to think that i can't afford something or this that no i think you should be treated like royalty i think you deserve it as you know what i'm saying if as long as yeah. it's within the budget whatever whatever you know what i'm saying um and i'm ready to accommodate that and i want to change the narrative about how africa in general and haiti i said it and haiti the the <laughs> unlikeliest of places and, and haiti i said what <laughs> i, I got said you. I said what I said. Um, and I, cause I think most of the Caribbean, they already have that narrative, but my place in particular needs help in that. Aspect. Right. It, it needs, no, it needs that help. And, and so here's what, here's what's really funny. I was telling you off the air how, um, I was looking at your TikTok and the things that I really liked about your TikToks was that you try to give a realistic picture 
Um, and as someone who lives in Ghana, right? Because <laughs> as we were talking, you know, for those who don't know, this was like COVID feels like it's lasted 10 years, but, but <laughs> right before COVID was the return to Africa, right? It's like travel just <laughs> paused, right? Totally yeah. paused. And I mean, you know, I told you earlier, like earlier, you know, I had gone to the Caribbean at the beginning of this year and then I went back. And I think that was my first, it was my first international flight since the pandemic. And I almost cried because got an email or a note from Delta and they were like, we've missed you. Welcome back. <laughs> <That's like Delta. laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I haven't been able to go anywhere because of this pandemic. And so, um, but, you know, prior to the COVID situation, you know, COVID situation there was the whole return to africa and i know that that's what put ghana and parts of africa on the map for particularly black westerners who didn't have an immediate tie and so one of the things that i mentioned that i liked about your tiktoks was that you try to keep it real right and so what are the things that you find because i know you are in these media streets especially if you're in marketing because i'm in these media streets too <laughs> <laughs> that when we see the TikToks and we see the Twitters and we see the Instagrams, um, that you think that there's a little bit of fronting on, but that's not the reality day to day when you are in some of these countries. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> right. Okay. So first of all, you know, of course I talk to Ghanaians and anyways, you know, like I said, I've been tracking Ghana since thir 2013. And before then, most people couldn't really point out Ghana on a map and now all of a sudden everybody's coming and that's fine that's fair you know I've talked to um, expect communities locals and I guess by hook or crook as long as they come in they see great fantastic their minds are changed it's blown in a great way however 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 I personally let me say it I, as a, I'm not Ghanaian but I can imagine how they feel in some aspects too they like it but at the same time too it's kind of like dang that's kind of a little fake too because Five years ago, nobody wouldn't even come. And then it took TikTok and all that other stuff to show them like, okay, well, they they have a pretty right. nice place as well. You know what I'm saying? And it shouldn't take that. It shouldn't take right. that. If you're really interested, you look up a place, you see if it works for you, and you go. It don't have to be TikTok. But now let me say another thing about TikTok, Instagram, all those stuff like that. And I try and I try to point this out to people who even watch me on social media because I have really great times here. Well, this time's here. But that don't mean that I don't have struggles and that don't mean I don't have tears and I don't have times where I'm like oh my god you know what I'm saying like that's the thing yeah. about social media that's dangerous is that it once again we're going back to the single narrative thing you know how I was pushing a single narrative on Africa that it was all war and famine and all that other stuff now it's pushing like, yeah. like in the place in Ghana it's pushing like oh it's only joy and that's not the case it's full of enjoyment right. don't get me wrong I love it this is my poem and I actually don't really want to I don't really see myself trying to separate myself in the future, but I would be amiss to tell my brothers and sisters, whether you're Caribbean or you're American of, of African descent, that it's all like daffodils and sunrises. That's a lie. Number right. one, just like you've said with um, Dr. Cox and another thing like that toxic positivity thing, like, yeah. They're doing that with Ghana. Like a lot of them are coming for what they call Duddy December, where they go and they drink and they pour in champagnes on watches and doing all types of stuff. So mm. they don't really know what it's like to really, really live here. December is when all the diaspora come. Everybody's there's money circulating. The street is hot. There's activity after activity, but that's not how it is all the time. And right. when, and people like, it's like, you know, like, I, I hate to have to say those things, but it's true. People have to explain to them, like, that is just not how it is. Like, I was explaining in one of my TikTok videos is that I live in, like, one of the more expensive neighborhoods around in um, Accra. And mm -hmm. um, I have water, and I pay for water, and I have water shortage. Sometimes I won't have yeah. water one or two days. Right. You know? That's um, real. I That's have real. electricity shortages. So if you like, I want to tell people that not to discourage you from coming to Ghana, but like, if you want to come know that you're going to need a generator, if you don't want any hitches, you understand right? what I'm saying? <laughs> That's it. It's not to, you know what I'm saying? And you have to be careful too, because one problem also, let me say with TikTok and all those things like that, is that you do have some of the diaspora, they come and they talk so badly and it's like, they never been anywhere, but you have to know, sweetie, that 
it's a developing country. Nobody told you that you was going to have the same infrastructure that you was going to have in America or if you was in London. Right. You, right. You get it? So you just have to find out where those issues are and you're going to have to learn how to pivot at when those issues come. If you can't, you got to stay where you at. <laughs> I love the way you said it. (laughs) Or you can stay where you at. No, and you know what? I have found the people who tend to have the easiest time are people who have grown up or who have either grown up or have some kind of familial tie to a developing country, right? So, or they have traveled extensively already in those kind of environments and it don't phase them. Right. So you're talking and I'm like, I'll tell you this as a kid, we had water outages. We had electricity outages. Right. Cool. Grew up as a kid as that just this summer. I've been to a lot of places, but I'll, I'll just pick on DR because I was in DR this summer or this past summer. We we had we didn't have water outages, but there were times the power just straight went out and it was hot. It was like dead summer. Like <laughs> it was hot, hot. And then hot, right? Which meant <laughs> the fan or the AC, if you had it, was not on, right? And I remember laying there being like, if this ain't like being in Cameroon <laughs> back in the day. And I was <laughs> like, it's all good. I'm going to crack open the window and just hope for the best because it is hot here at 2 a.m. So but you, you are right. Amanda, some people don't have those experiences. And then when they get to a place, they act like somebody did false advertising and then they just show them green passion, which it kind of is like that on social media, but it's not up to them. You actually got to go and do your yes. research and you Thank need to you. know yourself and be like, oh, can I really deal with, oh, they turn off the lights until tomorrow. Like, Thank that, you. You know what I'm saying? And like, like Thank you're saying, you. I, me as a Haitian person, I know those things. Me, I know, I know exactly what it's like to go take a bath with a bug. I know those things. I can't pretend yes. that I didn't know that. I didn't drink sachet water. I didn't see ladies carrying things on their head. I know all of these things from where I came from. So I'm not going to come here and act brand new. Right. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. I, it is, you have just hit the, the nail on the head and it is no matter where you're going. And it doesn't matter whether it is a quote unquote developed country or an emerging developing country. You need to do your research because you're right. Social media will give you one portion and one side of the story. And, and the, the problem with that is because, and it could be good or bad, right? Cause I love me a good TikTok. So I'm not going to lie. I spend a lot of time on TikTok. I don't make TikToks, but I'm always on TikTok. Right. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> And especially travel TikTokers. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> like I will, I will see what people, especially when they're like places I would never go to as, or I would go to as, or, you know, their experiences yeah, in this traveling. random country. Yeah. And, and I'm just sitting there thinking, here's the problem. Um, and people are entitled to have their experiences. I am not even yeah. mad at that. Right. Yeah. If, especially if you had a bad experience. You, that is yours. I am not taking that autonomy away. I think the challenge is your audience because mm-hmm. your audience didn't have that experience. And and also, we don't know you. I mean, there are people that I know well. And so when they do say things, I'm like, I can respect their voice on that. But especially when you don't know the nuances of the experience, it can mm-hmm. just come across as it's the whole country or whatever and not taking into yeah. the fact we don't know what you may or may not did. We do not know. You don't know the language. We don't know how much you know the culture. We don't know what day you showed up on. <laughs> like, we don't We don't know anything. No. And I get so nervous that we sometimes despair. Because I saw a country on there that I actually very much like. Someone did a story and they were like, this is why I would never go back there. And I'm like, because you did no research about the people at all. It happens. And it then, happens. And that's the thing. That's the, the thing about social media. That's kind of like scary and like i said don't get me wrong because I, and i and i'm so scared about coming off to people like that. i have really good times and you know really enjoyable times in ghana and you know within the pan-african world as itself but you know there's other day-to-day stuff that you have to understand that happens you know and i don't want yeah. and i'm so scared i don't want to sell you a dream like and that's another thing like about my tours and stuff like that if you you should know yourself if you know that you're not about that that's great just come and have a great time and then go back <laughs> You know, right. <laughs> don't bother right. these people. 
<laughs> right? Do not bother these people at all. Because <laughs> you know, you got to know the re- the re- to be on the receiving end too. And I I am so sensitive, and it does not matter the country in the world. I try to be sensitive to the fact that I'm having an experience, but these people live there. Yes, and often it's not. I mean, the they're same real people who live there. Dollars. It's never the same. It's why would it be the same? <laughs> it's never the same. And like like you're saying, like me being Haitian, I'm so sensitive. I'm so sensitive. I I I know what it feels like to be on the negative receiving end. You know what That's I'm saying? That's it. And That's I it. I do I will not talk poorly about these people. I want to say what my true experience is so that it can save like people who know themselves and shouldn't people who shouldn't be trying to move to certain places like this and save the drama for the locals and themselves. But at the same time too, you know, like I don't, I, I don't want to like talk negative, do it in a negative, uh, very um, connotation because I know how it feels like to have that push down your throat and it's not right. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing, you know what it's like to be from somewhere where there's constantly negativity and I, about your place. And I, mm-hmm. I feel that if others thought about, Think about what it would feel like if someone showed up to your hometown that you like and just said which said the stuff that people say callously yeah. because they don't have an, they don't have an emotional attachment to that place. Yeah. Yeah. They have no Once idea. You do. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's not right. And you and a lot of them, they be in here for like two seconds and then they, you know, and it, it shows like. Right. I, I don't know if you came to study <laughs> yourself in December. I don't know if you came to chase man. I don't know what you came here for. But you just gotta respect <laughs> yourself. You know what I'm saying? They came. I mean, let's people came to flash for for the talk and for the gram. I yeah. mean, let's let's keep it real. Let's keep it real for social media. And and so I think that this is why I think it's refreshing that you are out. And I think this is why it's refreshing. You do have your TikToks, and I know that your you know when your your brand is that you are working towards the balanced perspective especially as someone who's who is living and and i i know you would recognize that yes you also live in an area that the average Ghanaian doesn't live in but at sure. least someone who is living in the country and and is and knows kind of the nuances of being in a developed country i think that that's why your voice is important thank you yeah i think it's absolutely important and so you know I always like to ask this as, you know, as we wrap up with our episode, uh, what do you see coming down the pipeline for you and your business? What do you, what do you see next on the horizon? So um, I actually have it trying to be like multifaceted. <laughs> so I have, I have different aspects of it that I really want to obtain, but I don't know. Like I just like the biggest, my biggest, biggest dream in addition to having like Lux here in West Africa. Like I said, the whole reason that I started, the whole reason why I realize I have so much strength and I know that nobody can take me down is because I'm a Haitian. Number one, I know I come from, <laughs> that's a fact. Haitian history is black history. I don't care. Everybody needs to hear it. If you understand the story of Haiti, you will understand as a black person, whether you're from Africa, because that's exactly where they took those slaves from or anywhere in the Caribbean, that you are capable of anything. I know nobody can take me down. And, um, you know, I, I'm doing something in West Africa for the moment right now, but I want to unite the Caribbean and Africa because even not only is it African-Americans, the diaspora in Africa in general, we still have a lot to learn about each other. So my dream yep. would hopefully be one day to take West Africans and take them into a place like Haiti. I actually met a few Ghanaians who actually been to Haiti, which is actually really cool. <laughs> but um in like tour groups you know and even places even other different caribbean islands because even as i speak to them i see that they don't really have too much of a knowledge of the the caribbean but even the caribbean doesn't have too much of a knowledge of them and we just we need to start having these these travel experiences and start to know each other and i feel like that's where we will we'll start to have more love and growth and not stop seeing that rubbish diaspora words on tiktok please so yeah that's one of my big dreams so yeah You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficcio. Don't forget to subscribe to The Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram 
at the Global Chatter, or stop by Twitter and find us at Global Chat Pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter, or are interested in sponsoring, visit theglobalchatter.com. dot